Hello everyone, welcome to the Reds Tag on a wonderful Thursday morning here in Idaho. Um, so let's get started. There's been a bunch of college football news that's happened recently, and there's a bunch I want to dive into and digest. So let's start off with um, what the NSA president, um, Mark Emmert, said. He said that he's going to let the governor, he, in, so, in summary, he's going to let the governor's health experts and school presidents decide if they're going to have a football season or not. So it's not going to be up to him. He's not putting it on him, which I thought was interesting since he made that bold comment yesterday about how, like, like if there's no students on campus, there's no football, simple as that. But um, it's very interesting that he's leaving it up to different people, delegated to different people. So it's going to be very interesting to see which schools are going to be aggressive in pursuing um, a season as soon as possible, which schools maybe won't be ready or, or won't pursue as much. But there's been other news. Uh, for example, the... Cal State's um, university system, um, which involves 23 California schools, they um, so they said that they're not going to have any students on campus for the fall, so that's going to put football in jeopardy. And then something that's also been floating around is that um, Cal is that um, the California they I heard they are going to uh, most likely stay closed until all the way to August, which is pretty interesting. Because just recently, Arizona and Florida governors both opened up all their sporting events and stuff again. And they're all they're all clear, basically. And then another thing is that the Pac-12 schools are talking about doing a all-conference schedule only, so they play each other eleven times. So if you're so if you're a state, you don't get to play Oregon. If you're Alabama or Notre Dame, you get you don't get to play USC. If you're BYU, you don't get to play your Holy War rivalry against Utah. Um, if you're Michigan, you don't get to play Washington and so on. So that would be a lot of interesting matchups that we're going to have to miss out if the Pac-12 does decide to do conference only. Now, what's interesting is that um, the recently the SEC commissioner, he, he said that like the conferences are going to try to be unified. It's not going to be... any. It's not going to be any one conference's way or the highway, basically. They're going to try to be um, coming together and try to figure out a solution together if they can. So let's say if the Pac-12 does decide to do conference only, well, the and let's the, and let's say maybe let's say the Big Ten decides to do conference only. Well, the ACC, Big Twelve, and SEC can still have non-conference games. They would just have to replace those Pac-12 or Big Ten teams with another team, which means a little bit of hassle, but it can be done. So this is, but again, this is all, it all comes down to this is why my point that I made earlier is, it is becoming more and more valid that we should just wait in, until the beginning of next year so that way things are cooled down by then. And then hopefully we won't have to rearrange or cancel or anything basically. Because as of right now, it's a very, it looks like a very high percent chance that um, we're not going to be having um, football starting in early September. I just don't see that happening, especially if, like, if most everything's close to California until August. I just don't see that. So the best case scenarios we're most likely going to have in October starts the season, best case scenario. But again, I'm not sure if that's going to be happening or not. Um, we got to hope that within the next few months, things are just getting better and better, and then they come out with vaccines and that the cases are becoming decreasing and stuff like that because that's our only hope. Um, I'll continue to be fascinated by these storylines, and as we get more and more college football headlines, I'll let you guys know because all this stuff is really interesting, how the, how the domino effects are happening. So, for my other topic today, I want to talk about um, my my top 10 um, all-time NBA players list because ESPN had came out with their list, and I agree with, I agree for the most part with their list. I agree most, I agree with the What's funny is I actually agree with their top 10, but I just disagree on the ordering of that top 10. So to start off with number one, um, Michael Jordan is obviously the GOAT. He's, he's number one. There's no dispute there. I just don't get why people make the case that LeBron's the GOAT. Yes, LeBron's been in more finals, but he has a 3-9 record while Jordan's at the feet at 6-9. Like like also, when you think of clutch... Yeah, LeBron's been clutch sometimes, but not all the time. Whereas Michael Jordan, he's usually clutch, and that's what you define clutch as is MJ. Or at least one of the players is MJ. So it just makes, takes total sense to put MJ number one. Again, I don't get why. 
Um, the LeBron lovers have him number one because MJ is clearly the GOAT. Like, there's no dispute in that. And then number two is actually not LeBron. It's actually Kobe Bryant. And here is my reason why I have Kobe Bryant ahead of LeBron. So a lot of people make the argument and say that Kobe Bryant is the closest thing there was to a Michael Jordan. Well, if that's the case, if he's the closest thing there was to Michael Jordan, then he should be number two because Michael Jordan um, is the GOAT, obviously. And then we take that out. It's just like he's 5-1 and one in finals, which is really good. Um, when you also think of clutch moments, you think of Kobe Bryant. When you think of a competitive uh, mentality, the mom mentality, you think Kobe Bryant. So it just makes sense for him to be number two. And then number three, you go to LeBron James. Now, if you're talking about bet one of the best athletes or maybe the best athlete ever to play the sport, then you could put LeBron number one over Michael Jordan and stuff. But um, LeBron, he's had his ups and downs in his career. Um, mainly his finals record is the only thing that's the problem. Now, I will admit, like, he's been the king of the East. Like, he's he's helped break up. He broke, like, he destroyed the, the Celtics dynasty back when he went to the Heat. Um, he ended Paul George's run in Indiana. He also was basically a kryptonite for the Toronto Raptors. Like, every time they met in the playoffs, no matter what seed Toronto or, or Cleveland was, Cleveland would just beat them every time. It's crazy how that ha happens. But, uh, that, but, yeah, so LeBron now in the West, he's doing a very good job. I'll admit that for his age and given how long he's been in the league. But, again, I just can't put him as number one or two. I just can't. And then number four is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, he has the most points um, ever in the record books. I don't think he'll be. I don't think he'll be caught at all. He has the famous sky hook shot that no one can stop. Um, he's won a lot of championships uh, because he played so long ago. People don't remember him as much, but he was truly one of the best players in the game. And then number five is Bill Russell. That's who um, delivers the Finals MVP. MVP trophy is the MVP trophy's name after it. Um, he literally owned a decade by himself when he was with the Celtics in the 50s. Only MJ would have been close to doing that if he didn't retire for those two seasons. So um, he was he's a really good player, uh, one of the best big men besides Kareem to ever play the game. The next is Magic Johnson. Um, in my opinion, he's the best point guard ever to play the game. Now you can make now some people might call him a point forward, and that's fine. But the point is, he's basically the point guard, and he's one of the best to ever do it. When he and he's uh, represents the Lakers brand, helped become helped the Lakers become what um, historically they've become. So when you think Lakers, if you don't want to do one two, you can do Kobe Bryant one A and Magic Johnson one B because they both won a lot of championships for the Lakers together. Not together, but like they won um, Magic won five and then Kobe won five, so they won a lot of championships. And then the next one is Wilt Chamberlain. A lot of people forget about him as well, but he is a record holding machine. He scored 100 points in a game before, which I don't care uh, what level that's at. That's really hard to do. He's one of the best shooters and offensive players of all time, and that's why he belongs at number six. Number seven is Larry Bird. This is pretty easy. Um, kind of like how you th Magic Lakers, you think Bird, Celtics, and besides besides Bill Russell, he is the face of the Celtics um, brand, giving them a lot of championships, um, being one of the best players to ever do it. What's interesting about him is that a lot of people, when, he, when they talk about him, a lot of people feared playing him because he can go off in any moment and he can be so hard to stop. And then the next one, number nine on my list, is Shaq. Um, he's just, he's so dominant. Um, he basically scored at will around the paint because he was so big and tough. Um, he was just a scoring machine. Um, him and Kobe worked out pretty well together, won three championships back to back. To back. Um, the only thing I would say, though, is that if he was a better free throw shooter and, and better three-point shooter, then he can be up there on Bill Russell and Kareem's level. But because he can't do it, that's why... He's towards the end of the top 10 list. And then my final player on the list is Tim Duncan. Uh, there were a couple different routes I could have gone. I could have gone Hakeem Elijah, Juan Oscar Robertson, or even recent players like Kevin Durant. But I chose Tim Duncan for a reason. He helped a small franchise 
become an instant dynasty for decades. Um, by the way, he beat LeBron in the finals 2-1, and one of those times he was screwed up with the Heat. Um, when it came to the finals, um, Tim Duncan usually came in clutch. He usually performed really well, and he was a player, rival player that basically you can count on. So those are my top 10 lists um, to review. You've got Michael Jordan 1, Kobe Bryant 2, LeBron James 3, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar 4, Bill Russell 5, Magic Johnson 6, Wilt Chamberlain 7, 8, Larry Bird, 9, Shaquille O'Neal, and 10, Tim Duncan. Thank you very much for listening to my show today. Look forward to tomorrow's.